Um, just to welcome you all, my name is Kristen Kunkel. I'm an environmental education specialist with NAAEE. Thanks for joining us today for the December installment of our monthly webinar series. Uh, today we are joined by Curtis Ogden of the Interaction Institute for Social Change, as well as Dave Chase, who's part of the team at Antioch University, New England, working to provide information and training on NAAEE's Guidelines for Excellence in Community Engagement. So after some brief background on the new guidelines from Dave, Curtis is going to take a deeper look into approaches and guidelines for public engagement that seek to honor and contribute to the richness, resourcefulness, and resilience of people and communities. Next slide, please. And each month, a handful of NAAEE's affiliate organizations step up to help us co-host these webinars. So a big thank you to the 14 affiliates who are co-hosting with us today and helping us to reach new audiences and increase our impact. Next slide, please. Uh, just as a reminder, today's webinar is part of NAAEE's monthly webinar series. We aim to shape these webinars around topics of key interest to environmental education professionals that will help bring new ideas and thinking to our work and showcase thought leaders in EE and in other disciplines. We generally host <clears throat> excuse me, webinars on the fourth Tuesday of every month with some flexibility in that scheduling based on speaker availability. And we do plan to continue the series into 2018. So please keep an eye out onto EE Pro um, to stay up to date on upcoming speakers and topics. And feel free to send us your ideas for what you'd like to see in the webinar series moving into the new year. Next slide, please. Uh, for those of you who are new to Zoom software, just a reminder that all audio lines are currently muted, but we do encourage you to comment or ask questions at any time using the chat box located on the black toolbar at the top of the screen. You can send a message to just the panelists or to the entire group using the drop down menu at the bottom of the chat box. And we will be keeping an eye on the chat throughout the, throughout the presentation to take note of any, com in, any incoming questions or comments um, that will filter to, to Curtis throughout. So please do use that to communicate with us. Next slide, please. Should you run into any technical problems throughout the webinar, please feel, re feel free to reach out to myself or Sai. Um, we are both on the line here on Zoom. You can message us directly through the platform or you can feel free to send us an email and we'll, we'll get it worked out. Next slide, please. So at this point, I'm going to hand it over to Dave Chase to provide some context and background on the guidelines for excellence in community engagement. Take it away, Dave. Terrific. Thanks, Kristen. Hi, everyone. Thanks for being with us today. Um, Curtis's talk today is based on a, a set of guidelines, the newest set of guidelines that we hope you're familiar with. Um, and these are the community engagement guidelines that came out in the early spring this year. If you haven't seen them yet, um, after the webinar is over, wander over to the NAAAE website, um, seek out community engagement guidelines, and you can actually download a PDF uh, version of them if you want to get a look. Um, Curtis, could you flip to the next slide? So a little bit about the focus of these guidelines. Let me wait till those come up. Um, we wanted to create guidelines, we being NAAAE, focused on three things that many of you have said, boy, we could use some more resources in these areas. And they are community well-being, sustainability, and resilience. Next slide, Curtis. In addition, um, we wanted to make sure that the guidelines provided suggestions, again, per your request, for um, suggestions for working in inclusive working environments, for addressing social equity. Uh, for improving and expanding effective partnerships and for coalition building. And you'll find as you leap through these guidelines, uh, whether on PDF or hard copy, that they do just that. Next slide, please. There are uh, five key characteristics when we think about the guidelines. They are community centered, no surprise, based on sound environmental education principles like all of the guidelines in the series. Uh, Focus on these guidelines for collaborative and inclusive activities, um, oriented towards capacity building and civic action. So these are not just theory, uh, they also give you real world tools that you can go out and use. 
And finally, uh, these are embedded in a long-term investment to change. So while a number of the activities and, and the opportunities in this guide can be used on in an individual basis, they're also designed to be put together into a longer thematic uh, working relationship with those who you interact with. Next slide, Chris. With that, I am absolutely delighted to introduce uh, Curtis Ogden to you. And for those of you who may not have read the introduction uh, on the NAAW website, let me give you just a little bit of information. I'll sign off on video so that I can focus on doing this well. Curtis has served as a senior associate at IISC since 2005, and he brings his experience in education, community building, leadership development, and program design to bear on behalf of all of IISC's efforts, as well as his abiding passion for work at the intersection of racial justice and environmental sustainability. For many years, he's built a robust practice in support of numerous multi-stakeholder collaborative change networks throughout New England and in fact, the country. Curtis is a recognized thought leader around network development and social change and has presented numerous webinars and keynote speeches on these topics. In addition to his work at IASC, Curtis is an advisory board member to Embrace Race, a community dedicated to discussing and sharing best practices for raising and caring for children in the context of race. And he's also a member of the Research Alliance for Regenerative Economics. And I'm absolutely delighted uh, to welcome Curtis to our uh, family this morning and this, uh, this afternoon and to thank him so much for making the time to be here with us. Curtis, it's all yours. Great. Thank you, David. Thank you, Kristen. Uh, really uh, appreciate the invitation to, to be here. I'm going to hide myself so I don't have to see myself as I do this. Um, it's uh, definitely uh, a privilege to be here and uh, really appreciate the, the invitation to do this webinar about a topic that's near and dear to me and my colleagues. Uh, and to do this on the heels of our friends, uh, Center for All Communities, having done, I think, your last webinar. Uh, they're definitely uh, members of the larger family, have a, a lot of respect for their work, and in fact, have partnered with them over the years. So I feel like we're very good company here. Um, I, I don't want to go too much further without uh, also just saying thank you to um, everybody who's tuning in and uh, with a, a special shout out really to the environmental educators. Uh, especially in these times, uh, just clearly ecological literacy is uh, such a crucial foundation uh, for our kids, for adults, for everyone. So just uh, very, very appreciative uh, of the work that you all do. And uh, if this webinar advances your work in any small ways, uh, we'll, we'll certainly consider that uh, time well spent and, and a success. Um, I did want to make it clear that while I'm presenting this webinar uh, alone, I'm hardly alone. Um, I'm here representing my organization, which is the Interaction Institute for Social Change. Uh, and here you get to see some, not all of my, my colleagues uh, with whom I just have the, the privilege of working and learning from uh, these, these beautiful people. Uh, and so just to be clear, I'm here to share our, uh, you know, from our uh, wisdom from our collective uh, experience and, and certainly to do that humbly. Uh, we don't claim to know everything, but we've, we've learned some, I think, valuable things uh, over the years. And wanted to say just a little bit more about the organization that we come from, uh, the Interaction Institute for Social Change, for those who do not know it, is a 25-year-old uh, collaborative capacity building organization. We are based in Boston, though increasingly a, a networked organization with staff and affiliates spread out around the country and, in fact, world. Uh, and we work as, a, as an intermediary uh, that uh, partners with leaders and organizations, networks, movements, and communities to help them deliver on the promise of, of collaboration, of linking arms to create and maintain justice and sustainability. And importantly, something to lift up uh, in, in the work that we do and the approach that we take uh, is, is really to point out that we, we bring a point of view uh, that is uh, represented uh, in part by this uh, change lens. If you think of this lens, sometimes we actually present it as a prism uh, that refracts the light uh, of what it means to engage in successful collaboration. We look at three different parts or, or facets, uh, and those include power equity inclusion, networks, and love. And I wanted to say just a, a bit more about each of these since they're important for what we're about to talk about in terms of public and community engagement. Uh, first of all, we're careful to pay attention to and help name power dynamics in the initiatives uh, and the work that we support. 
We see power fundamentally as the ability to influence, um, and it's always present. It's not necessarily good or bad, but it can certainly be used for good or less good ends. Uh, and our perspective is that power is not fixed, that it can and must be built in many cases to ensure greater inclusion and uh, more equitable opportunities and outcomes. A second facet or part of this lens highlights networks as a fundamental unit of social change beyond individual people and organizations. So we see change playing out through these much more vast and intricate bodies that go beyond our own physical bodies and organizational boundaries. And lastly, we see love as an important force for social transformation. And this, uh, the L word, uh, sometimes I like to refer to it, uh, can sometimes get a bit of a, 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 a bum rap. And, uh, but I want to be clear that when we're talking about love, we're talking about love with courage, love with uh, uh, a certain kind of ferocity to it, uh, the kind of love that helps us actually reach out across boundaries to see and support one another in our full humanity and to really speak truth, speak our truths. So this full lens is important to us and has implications for the way that we approach our public engagement work. One other thing I wanted to mention as a, as a foundational commitment that we bring to the work is, is around um, helping people to fix their eyes and, and, and minds on the margins, on those who are most marginalized by our systems. And certainly we do that out of our interest in justice, uh, but we also do that out of interest in tapping into a much more vast collective intelligence, because we see that those who are living on the, the margins, they're often, um, doing that in very innovative ways. Um, and they're the ones living most with the failures of, of these various systems. And as such, they, they often bring a pretty clear understanding of the systems that many of us say we're trying to change and, and often uh, better and clearer than those who sit at the center and for whom things may be working just fine, at least uh, in the short term. And so we'll sometimes use this metaphor of a tent, a large circus tent, and how if you stake a tent uh, close to its center pole, it's actually less structurally sound if you imagine a big wind coming along. But if we stake it more broadly, reaching out, stretching out to the margins so that it covers more people, it's actually stronger. So when we design for and, and from the margins, we are actually thinking about that in and of itself as a contributor to uh, strength to justice and to resilience in our work. So with that, I'm going to pivot to the, the topic of, of the webinar, which is uh, community and public engagement. And I should have said at the beginning, I'm going to lay out a few more of these core uh, commitments and things that we think about in our engagement work, move into one example, and then I'll pause uh, for any questions and comments. I'll offer up a couple more examples and pause again so you all have a chance to to weigh in with questions and comments. So um, community engagement, I mean, it's always a topic of interest, but seemingly it goes through these uh, cyclical uh, periods where it seems to be of greater interest. And it seems like we're in one of those again, as you see many articles popping up about civic engagement, public uh, engagement, community participation. And a lot of that seems to uh, be linked to what people are recognizing as the failures and shortcomings of many institutions uh, and the rising demographic diversity in our communities and our country and just the sheer complexity of the issues that we face, social and environmental. And people are looking for better answers, realizing that simply defaulting to a smaller set of so-called uh, you know, experts um, or, or maybe uh, engaging in kind of perfunctory and, and shallow input is just not going to get the job done. Um, and at the same time, there can be considerable confusion about this term engagement, what it is, what it looks like, uh, you know, what it actually serves in the end. So uh, I wanted to actually invite people to chat in um, with some thoughts here. Um, take a quick poll um, around why engagement? Why are you interested in engagement? Why are you on this webinar right now? Um, why consider engagement in the work that you do? Um, what, are your, what are your hopes for it? Uh, if, if you wouldn't mind uh, chatting in some of your responses, uh, I'll ask Kristen in a minute to, to 
uh, read some of them off. But I will say, and, and certainly don't expect uh, this answer from anyone out there, uh, but one of the answers that we're, we're wary of when we ask that question is when we hear that the only reason for engagement is essentially to get buy-in for something, right? And that can often smack of uh, a really faux engagement that ultimately gives engagement a bad name because people see it as really uh, being about a blessing pre determined solutions and agendas. Not that I would expect uh, that answer from anyone out there, but uh, Kristen wanted to see if there are any answers coming in. Sure, we have a, a number of, of answers coming in. I see um, getting things done, not just knowledge. From Shannon, to build a bigger boat. Um, from Jane, engagement leads to action, advocacy, and change. Um, a couple more, more voices help us, oops, coming in quick more voices help us build more resilience okay great Kristen you're going a little a little bit in and out on my end I don't know if uh, that's being experienced by others um, but thank you thank you for those those responses so to build on what people chatted in with um, when we're looking at engagement and some of the reasons we might want to consider it some of the deeper reasons um, to echo some of what's been said and maybe to extend it, we're certainly looking at the importance of using engagement as a way of building trust, uh, that relationships just become foundational to the work of social change. Um, that the work of engagement can sometimes be slow and messy, but in the long run, it can increase the efficiency with, uh, with respect to the pace that we move further on down the road. Um, and that really lasting change is not possible without community uh, engagement and, and broad-based public engagement. Um, and you'll see uh, these other thoughts around uh, the why of engagement, uh, not meant to be an exhaustive list, but some of the considerations that we bring to the work. And then uh, there's certainly this other important question of uh, who it is that we want to engage. And in fact, this may be the first question that we ask before we get to the, the why. Um, in either case, one uh, phenomenon that we encounter is that sometimes people will talk about community and public engagement in these rather broad strokes that in the end is not really very helpful, especially when they use it as code for something else, such as those who are marginalized or those who are not typically engaged or those who um, you know, are, are uh, losing out the most in the existing systems. Our preference is that we actually get explicit, specific, and name uh, who it is important to engage um, for the purposes of, of designing and doing right by those people. So again, wanted to ask if there are any um, particular groups that folks on this call and this webinar are hoping to engage and uh, please go ahead and, and chat those in. Um, and while you're doing that, I will go to this uh, uh, next slide which is to say that sometimes uh, when we're getting more refined about who it is we're talking about with respect to the community and the public, we'll get clear that in some cases people are talking about, well, we want non-professionals. We're talking about the, the residents who actually live in this community, which is all well and good. Getting down to that level of specificity is great. Um, or I should say uh, residents um, could include professionals as well, right? People who work and live in a community or the non-professionals that we may not access in our typical nine to five or those who are most marginalized or we're looking for the unusual suspects, those who are not typically engaged or it could be all of the above. But again, um, getting specific about that is, uh, is really important at the outset. Kristen, any, uh, any, anyone chatting in? Yes, uh, we have lots of responses. Um, teachers that we serve in our organization, those who believe that engagement in our environment is necessary or is not necessary, <laughs> sorry, those um, vulnerable populations, elementary students and homeowners, uh, people with fewer resources, fewer resources, um, industry, the other side of the aisle and skeptics. Lots of good answers in here. Low income Great. communities. Yep. Great. Great. Great answers. Thank you. Thank you for, uh, for all of those who, uh, who, who chatted in. So great. Uh, and so in some cases, we're very clear about who it is that we want to engage. And then in some cases, we're not so clear. And, and so our role uh, in uh, diving into this public engagement work is to help people get clear. And sometimes we'll do that by uh, bringing this definition of, of uh, what uh, stakeholders, uh, who stakeholders might be. Um, and, and often we are uh, 
pointing people's attention to certain stakeholder groups and perspectives that people may not often think about. So those are highlighted in red here. Uh, voices that are unheard or typically marginalized. Um, of course, if they're not often heard or seen, we tend not to think about them, but really asking people to uh, consider who is not typically at the table. Those who function as connectors and intercross sectors, or weavers, if you will, in network language. Um, and those who bring influence uh, in communities and the public who may not have formal authority. They may not be elected to anything or be the, uh, <clears throat> the head of an organization, but they are sort of the informal mayor, if you will, of the community. Somebody who's been there for a long time, has incredible knowledge and influence. So um, sometimes uh, bringing this uh, definition of stakeholders can be useful to help um, people get more, more specific. And then there is this question of what we actually envision as the type of engagement we want to design and facilitate, and, and this being driven by the why and the who, uh, these other questions we've considered. And of course, there are so many different ways that we can engage people, seemingly ever growing and creative. Uh, and something we find helpful at the start is to help people name the degree of engagement that they're, they're seeking uh, and, and uh, to make sure that that aligns at least with their stated goals. So there's this spectrum that we sometimes consider uh, that um, goes from relatively and, and, and shallow, and I don't necessarily mean that in a, a negative way, but uh, not, as, not as deep engagement if we're thinking about one-way communication to more robust co-creation, really rolling up shirt sleeves and, and, and co-designing together. Uh, and there's another dimension that this last arrow points to uh, that we could perhaps name as engagement that supports uh, the, the sovereign self-organizing and self-determining capacity of communities, uh, segments of the public and communities. Uh, and really, um, the idea here is that they're all legitimate forms of engagement, um, whether the intent is just to get you know, really important information out to people as quickly as possible, to gather input with the authentic intent of having it inform an effort or to walk together and support a journey towards liberation. Uh, the problem is often when we say one thing and do another, typically over promising on the degree and the depth of the engagement and scale, scaling back for whatever reason. And again, that can give engagement a pretty bad uh, reputation. So it's a, definitely an important question uh, with which to wrestle, we've discovered over time. And one last, um, framework, um, if you will, is that we um, like to think about engagement as playing out over uh, any number of different phases. Uh, and it can be helpful to, to break this down somewhat as we're thinking strategically um, about engagement, who to engage and how. So these are five phases of, of public engagement we often talk about. Um, they are certainly not um, exhaustive, but we found them to be very helpful and in fact have used these as ways of engaging the public or community. So we have uh, framing, or you might think of this as visioning, where the public or the community is invited in to define the problems and opportunities uh, that that community is facing, to ideating, where uh, people come up with uh, ideas about how to address those problems or uh, leverage those solutions, uh, to prioritization, getting uh, public input on the most important solutions on the table that they've come up with, or perhaps that others have come up with uh, previously. Uh, deciding where the public actually makes the, makes the decision or elements uh, of the solution, what is going to move forward. And then implementing, once uh, decisions have been made about what's going to move forward, um, helping to create the structures for monitoring those solutions to ensure that they're, they're on track. So uh, again, can be helpful to break down engagement into distinct phases uh, to think more strategically and also to be respectful uh, of those that we seek to involve. So with that, I wanted to move into uh, one example uh, and then I'll take a pause for questions and comments. Um, and uh, this is uh, engagement work that I've been involved with with a, a team, an amazing team that we have at the Interaction Institute for Social Change. And this is the story of uh, Hunts Point Resiliency. So the brief background to this is that in June of 2013, uh, the US Department of Housing and Urban Development, or HUD, launched something called the Rebuild by Design Competition, which was intended to spur new ideas and collaborations for improving um, coastal, coastal area resiliency uh, in those areas that were impacted by Hurricane Sandy. 
So Hunts Point Lifelines was one of six winning proposals in a competition. Um, and uh, it put forward this resiliency plan for the Hunts Point community in the South Bronx. Uh, that plan itself was developed by a team of uh, multidisciplinary professionals who work very closely with local stakeholders over many months. And ultimately $45 million was awarded by HUD to advance the concepts from that rebuild by design proposal. Uh, and then to implement some uh, resiliency, pilot, resiliency pilot projects. So uh, New York City Economic Development Corporation or EDC and the Mayor's Office of Recovery and Resiliency started to convene stakeholders in 2015 to further flesh out, develop, define these resiliency priorities and recommend recommendations that were linked to that uh, Lifelines uh, report. And uh, at that point, EDC brought us in to uh, design and facilitate a, a pretty robust uh, public engagement process that was focused specifically on two feasibility studies for energy resiliency and flood risk reduction, reduction as well as a uh, conceptual design for a resilient energy pilot project. And I have to say at the outset, just to give a big shout out to EDC and the mayor's office, as well as the HDR engineering firm with whom we partner on this work. It is not every uh, municipal agency uh, engineering firm, um, you know, or other bureaucratic body that would uh, willingly go down this road of pretty in, 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 in robust engagement. So their willingness to go deep, uh, you know, invited us to think uh, about how the engagement process itself could be a contributor to resiliency in the community. So in other words, if we think that threats to resiliency are not simply uh, a result of being a low lying coastal community, which Hunts Point is, or uh, you know, stemming from a community lacking re reliable backup energy, um, and, and extend that to think about resiliency or lack thereof as, as residing in social disconnection and impaired flows of key, key resources, then we can see how uh, in, engagement infrastructure and processes can actually tap into and, and boost resiliency in a community. So coming into Hunts Point, we, we already knew that uh, we were aware of some of the, the vulner vulnerabilities of the community. But we also knew that it has um, considerable strengths and that it's very well organized and has some incredible social service and community organizations doing work on the ground. All that said, we know that even when these kinds of assets are in place, there are just too many examples of projects that bypass or fail to fully honor that existing work and the networks on the ground with the results ranging from missed opportunities to actually doing harm, right? When we leach people's time, when we leach their trust ultimately. So we were wanting to certainly do right uh, by the community. And the counter to that then was to honor and help and support uh, the existing networks and the social capital in the community. And so one way we did that is that we worked with OR, EDC, and HDR to establish and support a, a set of overlapping and interconnected teams that each fill a unique function and kind of collectively slow down what might otherwise be a pretty overwhelming storm of technical information um, and, and rapid fire meetings. So these teams, which I won't get into in, in exquisite detail right now, are meant to serve as a kind of root structure, if you will, that helps hold the community soil in place around this project, that captures value uh, and adds value to the flows of uh, important technical information that's being gathered and disseminated. Uh, and without going into all the details, uh, again, I wanted to point to one of the teams in particular, uh, which is known as the Neighborhood Outreach Team, which is in this outer orange circle. And here's a picture of, of some of the members of that team. Uh, the Neighborhood Outreach Team has been composed up to, uh, of up to about 10 residents from the Hunts Point community. And they were uh, selected and they've been given a stipend to do extensive and targeted outreach and education in the community to gather and amplify uh, input and voices at the neighborhood level. Um, and their work has included considering which groups and residents are most marginalized and disengaged um, or those who would most benefit from engagement and, and then thinking carefully through how to engage them. So collectively that outreach team has done flyering, uh, neighborhood conversations, tabling at events, 
They helped to construct and disseminate a survey around emergency preparedness. And then individual team members have done very creative media projects, including uh, producing a series of podcasts uh, and a video, all that are resiliency themed. Again, um, trying to get information out into the community, but also portraying uh, what's important to the community around this theme of resiliency. Uh, in addition, throughout this project, uh, we've done a series of public meetings that are open to anyone, uh, but are really especially designed for those who live and work in the Hunts Point community. And at these meetings, we share project-related information, we gather public input and priorities related to key decision points around uh, the project's deliverables. And our team's design and facilitation of these meetings has been guided by um, a number of principles uh, shown here um, that are really all geared toward ensuring that the meetings are inviting, that they're accessible. Uh, so ensuring that we use a well-known centrally lo located place, provide childcare, translation, um, food, uh, and then ensuring that anything that gets presented is presented in such a way that it is accessible. Um, not too uh, technically inaccessible and give people a chance to digest uh, and really engage with one another to make meaning of the information. Another engagement mechanism that we've been really excited about that's been well received is what's called the Hunts Point Resiliency Arts and Residence Project, which was um, conceived to engage local residents and workers around the effects of climate change, local Hunts Point resiliency plans, and to educate residents that may not be aware of or prepared for the effects of severe weather on their neighborhood. So this project was uh, coordinated by the Point uh, Community Development Corporation, CDC, uh, which has a long history of using arts and culture as tools in grassroots organizing. And ultimately, uh, three amazing New York City artists were hired and listed in this initiative. Uh, Isabel Garbani, who made temporary large-scale installations using recycled materials as the main material. Uh, Mariposa Fernandez, who engaged the community by setting up pop-up writing workshops on the theme of resilience. And uh, Roy Secord, who created a public sculpture and exhibition from uh, these photographic portraits of um, these beautiful portraits of community residents and local leaders. So really creative, engaging ways of um, making the conversation about resiliency um, inviting uh, and, and, and very engaging. And the last thing I'll say before pausing here is um, one other engagement mechanism I wanted to highlight is something we did over the summer, um, building on uh, the work that we had done to that point. We uh, partnered with the staff from the Point CDC to host and facilitate this uh, very interactive day-long convening for representatives from the Hunts Point community, uh, nonprofits, business owners, and city, city agencies. The, the focus of this lab was really deepening the conversation about resiliency to get to some of the things that the community often wants to talk about most. Uh, certainly they're concerned about uh, resiliency in terms of future storms, but they're also concerned about resiliency around economic issues uh, and social is issues. So this day included a, a variety of engagement techniques that we facilitated with others in the community, including World Cafe conversations, spoken word art. There was this amazing uh, DJ from the neighborhood outreach team who played uh, music that would just engage people's bodies, minds, spirits. Uh, and we invited in artists, uh, I should say activists from uh, neighboring communities to share more about what they were doing around resiliency. So overall, just a very robust, uh, day uh, that participants said they got a lot out of and, and appreciated being able to connect dots to some of the things that they were really eager to talk about. And again, a, a big shout out to EDC and ORR and HDR for supporting, for supporting all of that. So I did want to pause at this point and Kristen see if there are questions or comments. Uh, I've seen things popping here and there. Yeah, sure. There, there are a couple of questions about um, funding. The, the first one being, um, they're curious, how much did you find was necessary um, in order to ensure your outcomes were being met to your desired standard? Yeah, that's a great question. So obviously, this is a lot of activity and this constitutes one of the more robust engagement efforts that we've done. And we couldn't have done it without a team of five of us. 
uh, and then uh, to say nothing of you know other uh, resources and supports uh, for the the public meetings. So you know we're talking about getting into you know the order of hundreds of thousands of dollars to do this kind of engagement effort. That said, um, we've done engagement uh, efforts on a, uh, on a you know a shoe a shoestring as well, um, uh, and uh, really it being about creativity and certainly people seeing value uh, in doing the engagement work uh, so that they'll show up. Great, and sort of a follow up to that: um, Did your project budget cover the principles mentioned in one of the previous slides that listed food, childcare, et cetera? It, yes, absolutely. So there is a budget line item for food, for child care, uh, for the neighborhood outreach team, um, for the various art projects, the artists and residents, etc. Great. Um, did you invite schools to these? If so, was it at the school district level or specific schools and their principals? So that's a great question too. So outreach did go to um, schools, to educators, to um, youth agencies. Uh, we did get students showing up to the public meetings uh, who've been amazing. Um, and um, we have had participation from, from um, various agencies and schools, typically not below uh, the high school level. Great, that is all I see at this point in terms of questions. Okay. Okay, great. Thanks, Kristen, and thanks for those, those questions. So I'm going to go another step forward here with a couple of other examples that aren't going to be as long, and then we'll pause again for any, any questions. Um, so this, this other example I wanted to lift up is um, something called Go Boston 2030 that uh, I was not directly involved in this, but a team from the Institute was. Um, so this is an initiative of the city of Boston that was designed to envision the future of transportation for the city for the next five, 10, and 15 years. Uh, the, the effort ultimately has developed this uh, rather far-reaching vision that um, gets into policies and projects that uh, are designed to improve and transform transportation for the city's residents, for businesses, and, and certainly for visitors who are coming to the city. Um, and so there was a two-year process with which our uh, organization was involved. Um, and, and the city actually now refers to that engagement process as, as the gold standard um, for, for engagement, for what it's worth. Um, and uh, our work specifically was focused on designing a process so that the public would actually frame the vision and be involved in uh, ideation. So creating solutions to bring that vision to life. So just one, one main thing I wanted to highlight is uh, a key feature of that framing process was something that's called uh, the question campaign. So the idea behind the question campaign is really that often engagement processes begin with uh, a predetermined question or a set of questions that may or actually may not be important or meaningful to the community or segments of the public. So in some cases, you know, these predetermined questions are actually predetermining solutions uh, that also may or may not be meaningful to the public and community. So the idea with this question campaign is that we invite people to step back and ask the community at large to determine the questions that they have that are most alive for them and really trust and honor the intelligence that those are gonna speak to something uh, important to the community. And if we follow that, that lead, that's gonna take us to some more powerful places. So with um, Go Boston uh, 2030, we worked with the city to ultimately collect over 5,000 questions that people would write about transportation. Again, meaningful questions to them. And in the process touched on every neighborhood in Boston. And we did that by inviting uh, people to submit a question in a way that made sense to them and also meeting them wherever they were. So for example, people could submit questions via a text or email or handwritten cards. They could tweet, use Instagram, Facebook. Um, we designed, uh, as is pictured here, an interactive glass truck that actually went to 15 neighborhoods and sat in strategic you know, public places to gather questions. We used digital media to publicize on the city's social media pages and built the following and attracted questions that way. We had over 80 partners from city agencies to grassroots organizations committed to bringing their networks into the campaign. And we participated in existing events all over the city. 
to um, you know, leverage those events to gather these questions. And as these questions came in, they were organized uh, by this core team, um, by themes and zip code, and then made available for viewing on the Go Boston website to be transparent about what was flowing. Um, and then we convened this question review session for a half day with city officials and community le leaders uh, where they worked together to review those questions, uh, then understand and articulate what the public was saying, and then to identify sets of questions that seemed to best represent what was most recurrent, most provocative and visionary amongst um, everything that people were saying. Um, and in this and, and then other similar question campaigns, the, the questions can then be posted in public places on billboards or on public transit for people to read and consider with the idea that it's there to spur ongoing public and neighborly conversations about the questions that they've already identified as being important to them. Uh, after the, uh, the, the question campaign in this instance with the city of Boston, um, we moved into what was called a visioning lab, a place where people could come and share their vision of uh, a desirable future for transportation in the city. And that lab was designed to really test the, uh, the resonance of the themes, the questions, and the different ideas that had emerged from the, uh, the question campaign and the question review session. So people were invited to answer some of the key questions and also to express how they imagine seeing each vision idea come to life. So the, the lab itself was held um, back in 2016 in May uh, at the China Trade Center. Um, we asked the public to help us develop a big vision for the future of mobility. The event was free, it was open to the public. People could write on walls, they could create designs at this creation, uh, creation station. Uh, they could like other people's ideas with stickers and tokens. Um, to, to guide ultimately the development of goals and, and targets that are now, now exist in a, a vision report, which you can find uh, at the Go Boston website. So uh, a, a very innovative, certainly resource intensive uh, way of engaging the public in a pretty important topic uh, when you think about transportation. So I wanted to highlight that. Uh, and then I'm going to just point to one other one, uh, maybe a little bit more briefly than I had intended to make sure that there's time for questions. Uh, and so this is, uh, this is an example that's very near and, and dear to me. Uh, it's called Food Solutions New England. Um, and I've been very involved with this for the past uh, six years. Food Solutions uh, New England is a, is a regional network that came together out of uh, concerns about climate change and economic volatility and food insecurity. And it was really birthed out of um, initially some academics saying, you know, we could and probably should be much more uh, self-sufficient in our food production than we are right now. And, and what might that look like? How might that be feasible? And they came to this idea that we could and maybe should produce at least 50% of, uh, of the food that we consume in New England by the year 2060. Well, when that vision was put in front of a, a group that was gathered at an annual food summit, uh, these food summits were held over about six years, um, between 2011 and 2016, it was it, the, this idea was met with both enthusiasm and some, some doubt and some suspicion. Um, and ultimately what it led to was this idea that what we need to do is really create much more connectivity, uh, trust and alignment around the region and really build out this network. So over time, this is uh, the result of six years uh, and I realize this may be a very overwhelming graphic, but this is really the network, uh, network infrastructure that we have for Food Solutions New England now uh, that has been built out over time similar to what you saw at Hunts Point, uh, various teams serving a variety of functions uh, and then various interconnections going between these. Um, I, I wanted to highlight uh, two of these uh, engagement mechanisms. And one is uh, what we call uh, the ambassadors. So um, over the time that that network has evolved, uh, it has evolved a broadly held, commonly held commitment to racial equity, basically saying we cannot work for a sustainable food system if it is not an equitable food system. And we have to put racial equity first um, with the belief and understanding that would lead us to other forms of inequity, but race and racism being so entrenched and so predictive of outcomes 
uh, in our country, um, that that was where we wanted to go first. And so uh, in a way, the ambassadors team was birthed out of that commitment, uh, these three extraordinary uh, people who embody the network's commitment to the vision and to racial justice were supported to um, weave connections, to go out into communities, uh, to engage with new and diverse partners, primarily in the Southern uh, New England states where there's considerably more racial and ethnic diversity. Um, and in so doing their weaving work, uh, they were creating more space for racially diverse leadership and, and mentoring opportunities within the network. Uh, really, their, their work has been uh, extraordinary and has grown the network from being a predominantly, though not exclusively, white network to one that is significantly much more diverse so that it has really changed uh, the fundamental conversation that we have around what it means to be uh, working for a sustainable food system. The ripples they've created um, have engaged others in the network in meaningful ways. Uh, one way that the ambassadors were very intentional about creating pathways to more active contribution to the network was using these annual food summits uh, that we were doing in the region. Uh, in 2015, uh, 15 um, individuals of color, extraordinary leaders in their communities and in the region, uh, who came to be known as the FSNE Trailblazers were invited to participate in that summit and then a new, another cohort in 2016. And now as a result, we have uh, many more than 30 trailblazers who are not just advocates for the food vision, uh, but really leading around what that means, uh, you know, for their particular communities and constituencies. Uh, they've been writing blogs, they've been contributing stories, they've been hosting informational uh, sessions, they've been a part of uh, a network leadership institute that we've started um, and uh, made so many more, more contributions that I could possibly highlight really uh, with the time that I have here. Uh, and there have been other uh, creative ways to engage the voices of those who are typically left out of the conversation uh, actually, uh, one young leader um, spoke up to the need uh, to engage uh, those uh, who are food chain workers, right? Farm workers and restaurant workers whose voices are often not heard and uh, whose even just uh, work to support the food system as it is or not is not acknowledged. Uh, so there was a, an on ramp created for a delegation to come to a summit of food chain workers, and as a result, uh, food chain worker perspectives continue to shape the direction of, of FSME's efforts. And uh, I will just say this uh, last word about uh, Food Solutions New England before going to any other questions or comments. Um, and that is uh, another, um, I think, unique and creative engagement effort um, that a number of us uh, started building on the good work of Debbie Irving uh, and Dr. Eddie Moore, uh, who created something called the 21 Day Racial Equity Habit Building Challenge, which existed in a, in a book. We imagine what, what would it look like if we actually took that challenge out uh, and made it much more broadly available, put it online, um, and invited people into 21 straight days of really normalizing the conversation about race and racism and what it has to do with food and food systems in our region. Um, without getting into all the details, uh, you know, there were online prompts, people could sign up for those to receive those in email. There was a place for people to have conversation online if they wanted to, though that was not required. Um, and we've gone in its initial year from about 200 participants to uh, nearing almost 1500 participants last year and we're hoping to do better uh, on that this year. Uh, and what we've seen through that kind of engagement is that people have actually taken that challenge back home to their communities. We've heard about challenges being done in churches and high schools and college classrooms uh, and in communities. So the idea really to create these networked and rippling uh, effects um, around the region. So just given where we are in time, I'm gonna pause again and Kristen see if there are questions, comments coming up. Sure. Um, there was a lot of um, excitement about the questions campaign um, and a question related to that. How did you ensure that your invitations um, to the Go Boston 
questions campaign and sessions were designed to encourage possibly marginalized groups to actually participate and see themselves as part as being the target of your message and did you have resources dedicated to overcoming barriers they might have faced to participating those are, those are fabulous questions um so well i say i would not say well I, again i was not centrally involved in that but no doubt we did not do a perfect job that said um you know, having those myriad mechanisms for people to engage, uh, which is also what we've done in, in Hunts Point and in Food Solutions New England was important. So, you know, making it accessible for people to text, use social media, going to the places where people are in their communities, um, ensuring that materials were translated, accessible, um, being available in person to help explain, um, uh, you know, what what uh, what this question campaign was all about. And again, partnering with other community agencies that had, and networks that had in reach into, you know, all, all aspects of the community, including those who are most marginalized for whatever reason was uh, definitely part of the strategy and the way that uh, resources were deployed. Great. Um, a question on the food solutions work. When working on a regional level, how did you determine how many people from each area to bring on so you had a true snapshot of the whole region? Also, how did you go about breaking up the region into target areas or areas of different levels of high or low priority? That's a fabulous, those are fabulous questions too. Um, so, I mean, the idea is that anytime we were creating a team, we were doing uh, our best to kind of create a representation of the whole region. And of course, that's always uh, imperfect. We certainly were looking at geographic representation from all six states. We were looking at gender and racial representation. We were looking at sectoral representation. We were looking at age. Uh, and so uh, over time, um, that has really been the screen that we've held up in, in terms of constituting teams. Um, again, not always doing that perfectly, but we've also been clear that, uh, you know, those teams evolve and there's been um, people who cycled off and others who've come in. Uh, so doing our best to, to make room uh, for, for growing diversity. Uh, in terms of where to focus, I, I would say that at this point, there isn't really a focus on particular communities or segments of uh, the region, um, really that network is, is, is there to supplement all the great work that's already going on on the ground in communities at the state level, uh, et cetera. Um, that said, you know, we've held uh, some uh, summits in uh, very strategically chosen places. So when we went to Connecticut, there was, there was great intent brought to going to the community of Bridgeport. Uh, for a variety of reasons um, that was strategic to bring the conversation there given some of the realities on the ground um, and and one of those teams uh, the process team with FSNE has become a, a, a really important for working out those kinds of details great um, let's see uh, earlier you mentioned providing childcare at engagement events uh, Wendy says, I agree with this need and I believe it broadens community participation. I'm wondering if you have found this success to be the case. Also, I think it is an opportunity to capitalize on our, our environmental education efforts. That is, we reach families and youth in a space very related to those themes meaningful to them and precise enough to tailor ecological literacy goals. Any thoughts on that? I mean, yes, yes, and yes. Uh, we have found that uh, providing child care and, 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 you know, in partnering with, for example, the Point CDC in Hunts Point, uh, which is known for just doing incredible grassroots organizing work and really doing right by the community, holding meetings at times when residents can actually come, providing services so that they can come. I mean, they just do it right. Uh, and, and, and so there's just proof that when you, uh, you know, understand what families or residents need to be able to be engaged and you give it to them, they'll, they'll show up. Um, and absolutely, then it, it, it creates opportunities for families to show up, for non-professionals who may not do work formally in that, but really are hungry to, uh, you know, for that information or to make a contribution. So, yeah, I think it's, it's really important. Great. Um, a, a quick reminder, the name of the book where the 21 day racial equity building challenge originated? Ah, uh, yes, it's called Waking Up White by Debbie Irving. And let's see, if, 
If someone is trying to engage the community on the grassroots level with no budget and no facilitator, what resources do you recommend? I mean, it's, that's a big question. Um, I mean, I would just say there's always resources, right? There's always uh, excess capacity in a community. There's always um, a, a willingness generally to give if people, uh, you know, ask. So I think, you know, there, you can do formal or informal community assessments around assets that exist, uh, engage in sort of bartering of services. I think there's so many creative ways that we can identify and exchange resources that don't necessarily have to rely on informal funding that we've seen uh, in play in communities and other engagement efforts. Great. Um, maybe we'll come full circle with a question that takes us way back to the beginning of the webinar. Um, someone con commented, interesting comment about love. What is your definition of love? I ask because it seems like folks have so many variant definitions. Logically, all of those definitions can't all be correct, right? Yeah. I love these questions. Um, I don't know that we have one single definition of love, but I'll offer up two that have been circulating around at the Institute. Um, one is uh, Umberto Maturana, who is a you know, Chilean system biologist who talked about the role of love in living systems, once said that love is seeing the other as a legitimate other. So really seeing across those lines of difference and acknowledging the legitimacy of, of other you know, humans or other beings. Um, more recently, Nora Bateson in her wonderful book, Small Arcs of Larger Circles, uh, talks about how love is allowing for the complexity in ourselves and others, which I think is beautiful um, to acknowledge and embrace the complexity that we all bring to our work and to the world. Wonderful, I love those definitions. Um, so it looks like there's still some great comments coming in, but that's, that's about it for the big questions at this point. All right, well, I know that we're tight on time here and I wanna make sure that we uh, honor, honor that. Uh, and Dave, I know you wanna pick it up here in a minute. I guess I will just um, end by saying, uh, don't worry about all the details of this slide, but, uh, you know, one of the things that we really emphasize, uh, I was just reminded of this when my colleague Alia said at a, a staff meeting recently, in fact, it might've been just yesterday, reminded me of the, uh, the David Cooper writer uh, quote, um, human systems move in the direction of the questions we ask. And I love that, that notion. And um, sometimes the questions we ask are found in the design principles and values that we bring to our work and to engagement. So if we're asking ourselves, what can engagement do for us? I think it's such an important thing to consider. Uh, it could be, you know, how do we want our engagement work to bring in the margins? How do we want it to work for equity? How do we want it to advance systemic change, collaboration? How do we want it to lead to healing? And so really the point here is that bringing our full creativity and design sensibility is, is, is um, so important in doing engagement work and not just relying on pulling something from off the shelf, but to engage in those kinds of uh, design principles that will be important to us, uh, including you know, those things that are ultimately gonna liberate us all from structures that are dehumanizing, from processes that uh, certainly um, you know, uh, are oppressing some more than others, but at the end of the day are doing nothing for our collective humanity. Uh, and so with that, I'll just leave this slide with a couple of our favorite quotes that I think do relate to this engagement work and ask Dave to come back in to bring us home. Or is it Kristen? I'm forgetting at this point. I think Dave's going to say a few words, maybe. <laughs> Hi. Hi, everyone. Curtis, thank you. That was outstanding and can't think of a better topic uh, as we're winding down the 2017 year to leave folks with uh, both a lot of information and a lot of opportunity and future thought in all of this. Um, I have just posted to the chat area for those of you that are interested uh, in learning more about the NAAAE community guidelines you certainly can go on the website and download the PDF um, but you'll see in the chat box, I've just posted three train the trainer opportunities regarding the guidelines that will be coming up in 2018. 
Um, it gives you an email that you can contact us on as of the new year to learn more about those trainings and answer questions you may have. Uh, and it's been a delight and a pleasure and a privilege uh, to host this webinar series this year, three different webinars uh, based on different aspects uh, of the community engagement guidelines. So Curtis, thank you once again for being here and for bringing this home in, in uh, such a powerful way this afternoon. With that, I'll turn things back over to Kristen for some closing comments relative to this webinar and uh, wish you all best for very happy holidays ahead. Take care. Thank you, Dave. Um, and just in the interest of time, Curtis, if you would please just go to the second to last slide. Um, just a couple quick um, housekeeping things. We will be sending the recording of this webinar to everyone who registered via email. You'll receive that email tomorrow afternoon. Um, we'll also be posting the recording on EE Pro, so you can keep an eye out for that. Um, and we are taking ideas for the 2018 webinar series. Sai has posted a survey link in the chat box. So we'd love to hear from you about who you'd like to hear from and what you'd like to hear about. And if you can spare five additional minutes to take our follow-up survey on today's webinar, we'd love to get your feedback um, about today's webinar and the webinar series in general. And that link is also posted in the chat box. So thanks for, <laughs> thanks for your patience with our surveys. We, we can't wait to hear from you. And thanks again to, to both Curtis and Dave for a wonderful webinar, a timely and thoughtful conversation. And we look forward to seeing you in 2018. Thanks, everyone. Thank you.